Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gunter Künstler. Um, at first, I would like to thank everybody who is responsible for this uh, wonderful um, conference that I have the chance uh, for sharing uh, experience here today. And a very special thank you to Roman Road who, who asked me to come over. We had yesterday a wonderful day. We enjoyed several wineries with a great hospitality and was really a great uh, thing to come over and to see your wonderful island here. Thank you. My theme today is soil, microclimate, and terroir in the Rheingau. And uh, at first, I would like to, to show you where I'm from. Or at first, a little bit contents. I would like to introduce you in, in our geography, in our history, in our soil, a little bit microclimate, terroir, and a summary of all, everything. So I'm coming from a very historic town, Hochheim am Main. It's uh, in spite of the being situated on the Main River, we are belonging to the Rheingau region. And I'm the winemaker and the owner of this winery here. And now let's get into the theme. At first, geography. The original home of Vitis vinifera is the northern hemisphere. Man, not uh, nature, is responsible that uh, also Vitis vinifera is on the southern hemisphere. And as you see here on, excuse me, I have to, As you see here, the northern hemisphere, the border is between the 35th and the 50th latitude. And the reason why we have much more, uh, that, we can much, that we can go much further to the north in comparison to the south, as you may know, is that we have much more land in the northern hemisphere, which warms up much uh, higher than in the southern hemisphere. So the southern border for viticulture is the 45th latitude. My map shows also here that Vitis vinifera does not like zones uh, with a higher summer temperature than 25 degrees. The minimum rainfall should be for Vitis vinifera 200 liter per square meter a year. Seven point nine million hectares, or almost two million, uh, 20 million acres, are planted with wines. This is 0.65 percent of the agricultural used land of our planet. The following table shows you uh, the planted surface, the production of wines in thousand hectoliters, the production of grapes in thousand tons, and the production of raisins also in thousand tons. So you see that Europe is still uh, producing the biggest amount of uh, wine. Now coming uh, to Riesling, uh, a grape variety which uh, announces a lot, but uh, in comparison to Chardonnay, it's almost nothing. So you see worldwide we have uh, 34,000 hectares of 7 million hectares. In Germany are 20,800 hectares planted. In France, mainly Alsace, 3.3. Austria, 1.6. Australia, 4.3. And United States, 1.7. Yesterday I have seen some very interesting Rieslings here. And also in New Zealand, 900 hectares. In comparison, we are producing in our country, in Germany, only 1% of the worldwide production. But we have 61% of the Riesling worldwide. So in comparison, in relationship, it's pretty good, only for Riesling. So now coming a little bit closer from worldwide wine growth to the European wine growth. This map here, excuse me, I... I have to have an advice in, in that red bottom here. Doesn't work. The red sign, where's the red sign? That one there. 
Okay. 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 Thank you. Oops. <laughs> Engineer and technique is getting together. <laughs> One more time, please. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, big pressure, okay. So we have here uh, the 50 latitude around here. And this is uh, the northern border of uh, wine uh, growing. The further north you go, the lower are the average temperatures and the higher is the average rainfall. The lack of temperature is a problem for ripening and too much water and moisture makes it very difficult to produce healthy, good grapes and for the wine production. The extreme of rainfall and temperature are minimizing the assimilation of, in the grape and viticulture. Further north than the uh, 54th latitude, it's impossible to grow wine. The, mob, the map uh, shows in detail also the interaction between the wine growing regions of northern, eastern, and central Europe in the, and their rivers. Um, especially, uh, the river Loire, Garonne, Rhine, and the New River, Rhone and Dines River, all of them are the living means of important regions in which extremes are smoothed down. In a big part of Western Europe, the average temperatures of July are moving between 15 and 20 degrees Celsius. In those zones are the majority of classic wine regions. In those moderate zones, with enough rainfall and sunshine hours, we find ideal circumstances for elegant, racy, and bodied white wines, and also for red wines with great potential to age. This is um, a map of our country, of Germany, and um, if you imagine that the 50 letter 50th latitude, there are also some cities like Winnipeg and Shabarovsk, and I tell you it's pretty fresh out there during winter and also during uh, summertime, and we can grow wine. And the secret for that is that we have in our country, uh, okay, we have in our country the so-called uh, German Mittelgebirge. Hillsides here, it's starting with the Harz, here, there and there. And all those hillsides are taking away cold winds from the north. And so are really, and on the bottom of the, those hillsides, you find in many cases rivers. The Moselle, the Main River, the Nile River, and on the bottom is pretty, pretty low. 100, 120 meters above sea level. And so we have no night chilling effects. And perfect examples for this uh, marriage is, for example, here, the Eiffel and the Mosel River, the Hunsrück and the Nahr River, which are protecting cold winds from the north for the Nahr region. We have here the Taunus Hills, which is, uh, and on their bottom there's uh, the Rheingau, and we are receiving a very special microclimate by by having uh, the sun reflection and also the captured water heat, especially during uh, September and October when we need really the heat, other regions are cooling down. Here it's still warm and it's easily to have 25, 28 degrees Celsius by the end of September, beginning of October. Uh, together with the Mosel, the Rheingau is internationally best known German wine region. The Romans have been cultivating the slopes of the Rhine and the Main River since the first century. It's also been told that Charles the Great has seen in the early ninth century the great potential for viticulture by regarding the early melting snow on the Rheingau slopes. By his way to the north, to the Netherlands, and to the North Sea, the Rhine River changes only once its north direction. With its east-west bet right between Wiesbaden and Rüdesheim, the river offers nothing but south-facing slopes to a sensible Riesling grape variety. So we have ideal conditions. On one hand, there's the north wind protection through the Taunus Hills. 
On the other hand, there's the heat and the sun reflection of the water of the river. With a total length of 30 kilometers, or 18 miles, and with uh, around 8,000 acres, 3,200 hectares of vineyards, the Rheingau is one of the four smallest German regions. But by having the ability to plant 80% with a sensible Riesling grape, the Rheingau is certainly one of the most prestigious regions in this country. Julius Caesar wrote at the beginning of his famous book, De, Bal De Bello Gallico, translated all about the, the war in France, Gallia is diversa est in partes tres. Gallia is divided into three parts. And here you see on the next page, Europe is divided into six parts. Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, and the Rheingau, which is a big vineyard above the knee of the Rhine. <laughs> So, coming a little bit to history, viticulture in the Rheingau has a 2,000 year old history. Evidence for that is a knife which was found in the village of Rüdesheim. It was also used for brewing the wines and it's from the third century. Another evidence is a little winery with two cellars in our hometown in Hochheim. We can assume that Roman troops have brought viticulture to our region. In literature we find the date of 200 31 past Christ. The following map shows the Roman Imperium with the capital of Germania Superior, Moganti Acum. Today it's the city of Mainz and it's only three kilometers across the confluence of the Main River. Here you see the Roman border going through Germany, and here you see the city of Mainz. In Mogandiacum or Mainz, where two or three legions continuous, continuously stationed and the close border against the Germans was the Limes Wall across the towns. Here you see a little bit better than, the, uh, than in the map before. And here you see Mainz, the Rhine River, and the border to the Germans during those days. And here was the influence certainly from the Romans, to bring wines with them. Okay. And you see, certainly, the Romans, they had to watch the Germans at this Limes wall. And many, many troops have been captured on this Limes wall. And certainly, there was also some bottles about the famous Rheingau Riesling. <laughs> they have been fighting each other. I think to laugh is a very good medicine. Okay. During those times, wine was really the only antiseptic beverage. As you see, soldiers were really forced to drink to get rid of fear and to stay really healthy. <laughs> Certainly we had to drink, and later on it was the result as everywhere. Okay, from Kaiser Karl the Great to Queen Victoria. The first written evidence of uh, viticulture in my hometown is dated back to the year 801. Monks from Burgundy have also brought the Pinot Noir, not Riesling, in 1107 in the Rheingau, and they have built the legendary wine monastery of Eberbach. In 1435, we find the first written evidence of a Riesling grape, a bill of 24 wines. German's great poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, born in 1746, died 1832, was a great lover of Rheingau Riesling. He loves to taste the famous Rheingau Riesling with monks, with monks, but also with girls. <laughs> Very often the next day was a problem, but you know, wine inspires. Rhine wine was in England known as Hock. It was difficult to pronounce the double H of Hochheim. Uh, since, this, uh, 
since the 16th century, the synonym of all good wine wines. This word was used because at the beginning it was also used for red and white wine. Later it was a synonym for all the good white wines from the Rhine Valley, not only from the Rheingau, also wines from the Pfalz area. Um, they're known as hock wines. Queen Victoria from England, 1819 until 1901, visited Hochheim in 1845. And since that time, Riesling achieved top prizes around the world and was side by side the great wines from France, the table wine of the European upper class. And if you see that old map from Shastorini and Brooks, uh, from, dated from 1896, you see uh, Rüdesheimer Rotland cabinet for 120 shilling a dozen, Marco Brun cabinet for 200 shilling a dozen, and if you compare it with the claret wines from Bordeaux, so you see the great attention of wines from my hometown during those days. Also, red, Pinot, uh, red wine from Hochheim, red uh, hock, was sold for the same price as a Volnay. But we are living today, and uh, we can look back into the future. So you see uh, also this old Dejeuner for the Tsar and the Tsar and his wife from Russia in Wiesbaden. A menu, Schloss Johannesberg, was side by side, Chevalier, Chevalier, Chevalier Montrachet and Champertin and Chablis as a great wine for the dishes for the European upper class. Here are some impressions about our little village. It's a historic town. And by that, I would like to raise the questions. Why was that during those days, those great attention? The opinion leaders of that time, a strong nationalism and consumption as well in Germany during those decades, the great geography of the Rheingau, was it the soil or a little bit of everything? I'm coming at first to the soil. In 1885, where was also, oh, excuse me. Where's the picture missing? In 1885, Heinrich Wilhelm Dahlen, chief secretary of the German Viticulture Association, published a book under the title Map and Statistic of the Viticulture in the Rheingau. His book is the evidence that people during those days had a serious interest to classify the value of each single vineyard. Mr. Darren pointed out that it's really difficult to make a correct classification of a vineyard's value. Reasons for him were the various influence of the wines by the culture of the wines, the quality of the site, the quality of the soil, age of the wines, planted grape variety as well, and certainly how man is cultivating the vineyards. Darlin measured finally the value of the vineyards in the benefit of the ground tax government. The higher the vineyard's quality, the higher the tax. Very simple. Oh, the map is not missing at the wrong point. So you see that old map here and the dark red Erbacher Marco Brunn. Hochheim Domlichenei Kirchenstück, Hölle, Johannesburg Castle, Rüdesheim, these are the very best sites during those days. So people had really a serious interest. Where is our best vineyard? Where can we have the best result for our wines? This was 100 years ago. Today, we have uh, also a classification made in 2004. It was, uh, done by, it was done by the Geisenheim Research Center for Viticulture, the Hessen Minister of Environment and Agriculture, the, uh, the State Government of Geology, the German Weather Service. We came together and they examined each square meter of the Rheingau. Each square meter means the 3,200 hectares, the 8,000 acres from here, there. 
And the interesting thing about radiation, temperature, wind danger, cold air danger, frost danger, below two uh, degrees Celsius, below four degrees Celsius, soil groups and the diversification, ability of each square meter to keep water. Water is really very important as we have heard today. Inclination, exposition, danger of erosion, and pot potential must wait. It would be, it would be overstretching to show you the, the whole book right now because it's really a, a classification of Grand Cru which uh, is based on science. Just an example, potential must rate of a part of the Rheingau. But it's, av it's available in a small CD for everybody who is really interested. It is also a book written and available. Unfortunately, not at the moment in English. <laughs> I complained about that because this is stupid. We have here a potential must weight, uh, 89 degrees Oechsler, this is around uh, 11.5 um, natural alcohol. And here's the bunch of the vineyard sites. And here we have the exposition of the mine gown. So we have here nothing, more or less nothing but south facing slopes. Who likes to get deeper into the stuff can buy that book in German, can ask for English edition, that the Rheingau moves on, because this is really important. We need some demand from the market that um, the Rheingau is sometimes too shy. Getting further to geology, this is just uh, the ge geology of the Upper Rhine Valley. You see, uh, see here the city of Frankfurt, here again the knee of the mine, and the main terroir, the main soils here. Here you find the Rhine knee again, and you see that brown color is mainly loess. Loess means uh, loam, and loam has a great capacity to keep water. This is the secret why we can also plant wines there. This is also the reason why uh, almost no irrigation system so far has been developed in our country because we have rainfall during summertime and the capacity of the soils to keep water and to give it back to the wines during the time when it's really needed. Again here, uh, the little part of uh, the Maingau, Hochheim. Now I'm coming to a very special thing, Terroir Hessen. So what does that mean? We, after that classification in 2004, there was a question, how, where's the reaction between soil and taste? Is there any interaction between soil and taste? And to find that out, um, the Hessen government and the Geisenheim, the winery school, worked together and they decided to, to pick out several sites with typical soil, that means, or different soil, that means slate, loess, fillet, clay, and so on. And these wines, they were made under the same conditions. These are the, the soils, slate, fillet, quartzite, loess, windborne sand, clay, or marl. And now I'm coming to uh, a lecture of a professor from Geisenheim. He did that lecture in, in Switzerland. Just a summary, it's not born in my brain but it's very important. In our country, we have the project Terroir Hessen. This project was made in order to discover if there is really a de dependency between soil and the taste of our Riesling wines. Germany is located on the northern border of world viticulture. 
Only vineyard sites of superior sun exposes, wind and frost protection are useful for, for viticulture. The quality classification of German wines is by law focused on grape maturity. This is nothing but the natural sugar content of the juice. This classification is not able, now comes to the point, to make a difference between flavor and sensorial structure of the wine. The analyze and the taste were something in between. But exactly flavor and structure of wines and certainly a higher focus of, on an individualism is getting more and more attention from our customers. So the discussion of the concept of a terroir evokes an increased awareness for different regional wine styles. The aim of the Project Hessen was to work out and to describe the main type and the characteristics of soil-based terroirs and the salting wine styles of the Hessen wine-growing regions. Um, those standpoints where the grapes were coming from, the grapes were delivered to the Forschungsanstalt Geisenheim and made there under the following conditions. Only healthy ripe grapes, only hand-picked grapes, transport in small boxes, total cluster pressing, chilling and natural settlement of the juice, and fermentation with the same dried yeast. Careful winemaking and bottling for, is for sure. Later on, the wines have been tasted of a well-exercised panel, and that several times. And then was the question, is there, is less and slate, is there a mixture possible, or is slate always tasting as a wine which is coming from slate? or wine from sand, is, it, is there a definition that wine from sand tastes all the, tastes all the same time, or from clay? It was, this was the question. And to make a long story short, we did that now the third year, and soil texture has a major influence on wine development and consequently on characteristics of the wine. In fact, Soil characteristics can help to explain difference in wine style within the same region or climate, climatic classification. The results show that the main soil characteristics explains wines of significantly different composition, appearance and flavor. That means the flavor of the slate is always coming through, through and it, will, it cannot be mixed with the flavor of the soil of the soil of a clay or of loam as a definition in taste. This is what we have discovered. Soil-based terroirs can be figured out by the soil type. The soil-based characterization of Hessen vineyards will be used for any individual marketing in the future. Because in nowadays, uh, doing globalization, if you go to a hotel group in New York, to Sydney, to San Francisco, everywhere you can expect the same style. And man likes to tend to do the opposite. He wants to go into individualism. He wants to discover not everywhere the same. He wants to see a different wine. Wine is not only a beverage uh, which has alcohol and some flavor. Wine is a beverage who has a distinction where many people were behind, have been working a lot, having put not only a, their wisdom, also the most important thing is the ingredient of love, to work on it, is in there. And this is the reason why we are together and why we are discussing all that themes. So, the secret terror exists, luckily. It is depending on the soil of its origin and the interaction of, with the microclimate is not transferable. Microclimate. Everybody is talking about global warming. We have, unfortunately, we have a change of a microclimate since 1980, 
and this is I would like to discuss. Here you have different uh, landscapes of the Rheingau, steep slopes in Rüdesheim and Asmanshausen, and gentle slopes in Geisenheim, in Hochheim as well. But you see irrigated vineyards, they are green. Not irrigated vineyards are yellow and brown. Sometimes it's really very, very dry. This was a picture of a year 2003 during August. This is the so-called Mäuseturm. This is a, a little tower in the, in the Rhine, which is around here. And on the other hand, you see flooded vineyards there. We get that more and more often, and there's a reason why. Again, six parts of Europe, <laughs> and especially Riesling with his sensitivity or sens sensibility. Again, this map here. We have a blunted surface worldwide. Only 1.2% um, 1, 1 is blunted with Riesling. And I have explained to you that we have, in average, we have 61% of the total production of Riesling in the world, uh, but only 1% totally. Climate change. What are the predictions? The most important ones. CO2 increase, among others, causes increase in temperature. The amount and the distribution of precipitation will be altered. This is really very important. Sometimes you are getting nothing, no rain. On the other hand, you will be flooded. Coming to the why we do have a little bit more CO2 in the air. Especially, here you see the years, especially in the last 150 years, we have a rise of CO2. We have a rise of methane. And we have also a rise of oxides. Especially, in the last 100, 150 years. So uh, this is a report of the IPCC, 2007. And if you see that red arrow, that makes me a little bit nervous, actually, what we have to react. Consequences. The CO2 concentration has increased to approximately 380 parts per million, plus 34 percent. The other so-called greenhouse gases have increased by another 70 parts per million. So we have totally 450 parts per million CO2. If we take a few on the centers of this planet, we see a total rise of temperature in Europe, in the United States, also in Africa, and also in the Far East, and also in Australia. What does it mean for our Riesling, coming from, global, from a global thing to a very uh, regional thing? We have here the observation of warming. And this is also a, a study of the IPCC. And this is the International Panel on Climate Change. In fact, uh, the, that scientists who have issued that first report of the IPCC in 1990 have forecasted exactly this current development. And what does that mean, that current development? This picture, sh this picture shows the temperature development on Earth since 1970. 
The gray part is the expectation range of the IPCC from 1990. Oops. So this is what they have expected. The interrupted lines are different predi predictions in terms of different expectations of the amount of emissions. The line, the steady line, shows the development, the real development of the temperature. The change of climate is for men much more obvious with extremes. This is in Germany, the first sunburn of grapes in 1989, and the very hot summer of 2003 with more than 2,000 sunshine hours during vegetation. The average in our countries is 1,450. And uh, this is just an observation, but uh, greenhouse grasses and car riding and whatsoever, this, uh, I'm asking myself if our children will punish us for being so easy going with that problem. Here again, what can we expect in 2040, in 2060, in 2080, and 2100? And so this development will increase if we do not do not anything. It will not be the rise in temperature alone which will, will, which will be the challenge for most West Central European vineyards. The changes, the changes which have already occurred are positive. That means for most of those European wine growing areas, it will be the temperature variability. That means actually we have that situation here, in the future, we can have this situation here in Europe. That means regions which, were, which are known for having a, a very hot climate can be in the future pretty cold, and regions which are known for a soft climate here can be very warm. And so we have to adapt on these conditions. And this can be a, a real a problem in our vineyards. Changes in temperature will influence the hydrological cycle and will cause massive fluctuations in precipitation rates. For most European regions, the challenge will be utmost flexibility with respect to cultural practices. Example, cover crops to buffer fluctuation in soil water content to avoid erosion. At the same time, we have an irrigation set up in case of extended dry periods. We have to create our own flexibility in Europe. That means if we are suffering from a drought, we, are, we have to have the possibility to irrigate. That was not the use for the last 2,000 years. 2,000 years. In future, we have to do that. And we have also to watch out um, the sun and also those cover crops. Extremes like floods in England, sunburn in Germany and Austria, what will you do with raisins like that? We have, to, we have to work on it. This costs a lot of money to cut them out that we, have to con that we can confirm only single ripe fruit in the future. Keywords are adaption and uh, acclimation. In response to rising CO2 concentration, rising temperatures, rising UV radiation, and altered precipitation patterns. Unfortunately, mainly traditional European vineyards are trapped in a cage. As I told you, we have to move. In many regions, traditional viticulture systems have been in balance with the environment for centuries. 
I told you 2,000 years. It was in balance. Is this endangered? endangered? Where's the adaption? How will be the adaption? Are some old vineyards endangered? This is uh, the steepest slope of Europe. Bremer Calmont. And there's certainly very little room for adaption. You see that vineyards here, there's a lot of investment necessary to, to confirm our, our winemaking for the future. Certainly there's also a change of sugar, acid, and flavor. So, we can divide. It was wonderful explained this morning from uh, Friuli. The microclimate can be too cool. What is ripeness? It can be at its best. It can be too warm. This is also the reason why we are here together. What is the best situation? Where's the best adaption for a grape variety? Uh, Petit Verdot in central Germany. Petit Verdot here on the, on the island. Petit Verdot in Bordeaux. Petit Verdot maybe in Madrid. What is the right plant? We have to work with a long-term plant. We are planting wines for the next coming generation. And where's the best adaption for it? Where's the best de uh, decision? But we have to adapt on climate, actually. So we have to find the optimum, the best yield, the best production system, the best analogical techniques, whatever that means. This is not my theme of today. We have, in the last years, really no bad vintages since the 80s. Why? And uh, warmer areas of southern Europe, U US, Australia, South Africa, there our grape variety would be too warm there. So we have changes here in the ripening period, going back where we are looking for the, for the best situation, for the best grape variety in the best soil, in the best climate. But climate has changed. So changes during the ripening period. At first, um, temperature. In August, we have higher temperatures the last 100 years. August is getting higher in temperature. September as well, October also as well. 20 minutes, okay. I will hurry a little bit. So, okay, nighttime temperature was also fall, falling down. So that means nighttime temperature is also, it's getting warmer during the night. What does it mean for Riesling? We used to have that window here, that temperature. Where Müller-Turga, Pinot Gris, Gewürztraminer is fine. This is 2003, and we had a con. This is 2006, so it's even even getting warmer. And what will we expect in the future? This is 2050. So maybe the problem will be that our Riesling grape will not 
fit so well anymore in our region. This can be a central problem. And because of that lag here. Cultivar suitability in the future. That means if you see here Riesling located actually here in Germany in a wonderful climate, Syrah expects another warmer microclimate like here in the Rhone. And how can that change? This is 2050. So you find here a lag, and it will get, it will be warmer in the future, and this heat raises the question if you can anymore plant the typical Riesling. So here you see Geisenheim. And for example, they did a cane pruning. The results between 1970 and 1986. You find here uh, tons per, per hectare, 11.6. Guyot system, 11. You find bricks, 16.3 and 16.6. If you compare that with the results of the 394 through 1000, uh, 2007, you see the same tons per hectare and a higher ripeness level, higher sugar, with minimal pruning and also with cane pruning. Grape composition. Malic acid also is going down. Tartaric acid is the same. We have more proline and we have much more aroma compounds. Where's the aroma potential? We have here uh, two, uh, three vin uh, four vintages, malic acid decay rates. You see it here. If you compare that to the vintage 1979, when you have a great difference of about uh, 65 days. That means our fruit is much earlier ripe and we have less malic acid. Malic acid, with Chardonnay, you're doing a, a malic fermentation. With Pinot Noir, you're doing also a malic fermentation. Uh, but acid, total acid, not only tartaric acid, is very important for Riesling. We have to have, we have to transport freshness. We have to make our customers excited about our wines. So, a lot of very dry material. Now it's getting a little bit more liquid. The first wine is now coming. With all those thoughts behind, we were thinking about our terroir Certainly, I have come back to concept, excuse me, because that was a free speech. In a steady, stronger, getting market, German wine growers have to consider about their strongest, unique selling position. The from France coming description of terroir is getting more and more attention since the last five years because of the fact that the soil, the microclimate, expo exposition, and inclination of vineyards is unique and cannot transfer to any other place. You must remember, Mr. Dahlen did that in 1885, and now we are considering more and more that uh, getting together of soil, climate, and man. Riesling is in Germany, not only the main grape variety, almost also most of the top vineyards are planted with Riesling. Riesling reacts also very sensible in different soils and microclimates. 
In addition to that, Riesling is Germany's internationally best known and best accepted variety. Only in Austria, also in Australia, Riesling has a similar importance. We have seen that uh, map. So Riesling and its sensi sensibility shows very easily the place of birth in comparison with other varieties. Parallel with the globalization, individual and regional products are getting more and more attention from educated and wealthy customers. In the French language, terroir means a lot in one word. Soil, earth, origin, site, vineyard. This is even not enough. To me, it is the unique, steady expression of the taste of the wine from a single vineyard. Independent from the weather of the year, because the character stays the same. It's not depending on the year. If a vineyard shows power, it shows power in a good, in a bad, and in an average year. But it's dependent from us, dependent from our work. The grapes from an outstanding vineyard can fall in the wrong cellar, and a good winemaker can make from average grapes also something good. There's also another de uh, definition, which is a little bit more into science. This is the definition of Geisenheim. A terroir is a group of vineyards or even wines from the same region, belonging to a Pacific appellation, and sharing the same type of soil, weather conditions, grapes, and winemaking, which contribute to give it specific to the wine. We have here a matrix. This is the climber, the, the microclimate, the soil, geology, and topography. That means um, inclination, exposition, and attitude. What you're getting now in the class is a 2007 Hochheimer Kirchenstück, Riesling Dry. And I wanted to, after being involved in the business since my youth, I grew up with a great winemaker and wine grower, my father, but we have never we have dis discovered different style, different tastes of our wines by tasting it. We say, oh, this is Kirchenstück, this is all the, all the time this style. And Hölle is all the time that style. I wanted to get rid of all those, uh, I would say, ex explanations which are not really very serious. So we made a hole of two meters deep in the vineyard and 80 centimeters bright in each uh, vineyard. And we wanted to find out what is really behind in our soil. We are in good contact with some geologists from the Hessen Institute. They analyzed the soil and another geologist imitated the profiles with a sap or with a, a raisin so that, he, that we can show our customers seven total different vineyard sites in our tasting room. Here you see how it worked. Then he, he has been cutting off the pieces and has put all the things together that we can show our soil. And luckily, the soil is totally different in seven vineyards. And um, we have also seven different phases of Riesling. Everything is Riesling, planted on the same great hill, but with a difference in the single vineyard. And if you go to, uh, to Burgundy, everybody knows what DRC is offering, the six sites. And everybody knows what is uh, Richbur, Glode, Bouchot, and what else. In our country, we have, maybe we have not lost that information. We didn't care about that. And we will care about that very carefully in the future. 
Now it's possible for us to give our customers totally true information with corresponding, corresponding wines. And this is really very important for me because uh, I, don't, I don't like to tell my customers any fairy tales. Because if you're telling the truth, the sound in your voice is coming through. And your customer is feeling that. He is leaving with that information with your voice is getting out and says, okay, I come back again. And to sell wine, it's not only, it's two jobs. At first, to convince your customer and when he is buying, but it's also the fact to convince him in this way that he is so believing in you that he's coming back. And this, is, this was for me the motivation to do that. Everybody is talking about terroir. Have I by my, do we have terroir in our own vineyards? Is it there or is it not there? This was a question which was really very big to me. So now Kirchenstrip, what do you have right now in the class? And I didn't expect it that really that difference here. We have, this is two meters, but uh, we have six uh, different kind of uh, soils there. And now comes the, the question, how will those soils influence later on the, the taste of the wine? I think the main roots are located here. And what do we find here? In number three and four, this is uh, the, the question. You can read it here. I think, uh, we have here in number three, we have a lot of, uh, of less topsoil mixed with a pale marl and clear risible is the profile here. And this gives the specific taste of the Kirchenstück to the wine because we have here uh, that clay and marl which makes the wine very dense, but also elegant. The soil has a wide range of properties as a result of the different substrates from which it is derived. The topsoil has a high clay content and characterizes the vineyard. The fine clay minerals impede water drainage so that the set, excuse me, saturated soil warms much slower in spring. However, in summer, the clay also prevents the soil from desiccation. The, distinct, the distinctive water regime results in special ripening conditions for the grapes. Here you see, again, the, uh, the vineyard, how it does look like. And finally, the wine to me, and this is the nice thing. Maybe it's obvious also for you, maybe not. It's only one man's opinion. The wine is fresh. The wine has a delicacy. The wine has uh, a message of being elegant. The wine has 13.5 alcohol. How can a wine be elegant with 13.5 alcohol? Why? Is it a low yield? Is it the soil? Whatever. I think it's a, a little bit of everything. Of everything means the right soil at the point where the roots are in, or the main roots are there. The next wine will be in comparison to that from the Hölle vineyard. Kirchenstück translation would be piece of land from the church. Hölle means hell. So, also by catching up the word, there's really a difference between the two wines. Uh, the Hölle is to me, it's also the, the opposite because uh, the Hölle is uh, a wine which has to have two years more time to develop and has also a completely another soil. Going back, uh, the side characteristics of the Hölle is uh, the average water holding capacity, very mineral rich subsoil, 
a high concentration of calcium carbonate. And this high concentration of calcium carbonate, from there are the minerals coming. And you find it here. To go into each vineyard site would really overstretch it right now. We did it for every vineyard. I have it on a small CD. It's, you can copy it, whatever. But the main thing is you have to react on your own soil. You have to, to discover it. You, ha you have to know what are you doing and you have to know what nature is offering to you. And with that knowledge and that combination, you can react by farming, by winemaking, and also by the communication to your customers. When your customer is getting what he really wants to have, maybe for Sunday night, a wine from Long Island, and maybe on uh, Saturday evening, a wine from the Rheingau, and maybe for Sunday lunch, a wine from Bordeaux, whatever. But your customer is, is really best informed. And this is uh, what is really important to me, when we are telling the truth, that we are informing our customers completely. I'm looking forward to your opinion of the difference is, is uh, tasteable because uh, both wines were made in the, under my conditions in the same way. Both wines were made in large oak casks. Both wines were harvested late. Both wines have 13.5 alcohol. Both wines were coming from 40 to 50 year old vineyards. Summary. The Rheingau is one of the fourth smallest wine growing region of Germany with a 2,000 year old history. At the end of the 19th century, Rheingau Riesling were among the most expensive wines of the world. The government had during that time a great interest to measure the quality of the vineyards. In the last 10 years, the Rheingau region worked out on basis of science an exact quality map of each square meter of the region. The change of the climate helped northern, helped northern wine growing region to increase the quality, negative and also positive. In addition to the project Terroir Hessen, examined the relationship between the taste of the Riesling and its soil origin. We did the same. Hopes, the hope is dying at least, you know. What, one, what we want to do with our wines? We want to get better. As you, we want to get better. And uh, very important is that we can do it in the future. We have to be successful. We have to make our wines with a lot of wisdom, a lot of science, a lot of energy, a lot of love. But anyway, we have also to make ends meet. Is, is the fact. And so I hope we can achieve in the future that also again Hochheimer Kirchenstück will, will be on the table of some opinion leaders of today. It's a long way, but um, stone by stone and with work, with good work in each year, I, I hope we can achieve that. Finally, I have to thank at first, not all those guys, I have to thank you for listening to me. I hope my English was not too bad. I hope my, my lecture was interesting for you. It would have been impossible with the support of Professor Dr. Hannes Schulz, Professor of Viticulture Geisenheim. He offered me all the deta details of his, of his reports of also Professor Dr. Ottmar Lönerts, Professor of Geology, Dr. Peter Böhm, Doctor of Geology, and of course, our daughter Ann-Kathrin, who designed that on the screen here. 
I'm a wine grower. I'm not specialized on, on making uh, speeches like that I did today. And certainly my wife, Monica, he, she told me all the time, get to work. You have to do something here. <laughs> we want to have some information. Get out of the vineyard, get out of the cellar, come to your desk and do something. I hope it was not too bad. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you Gunter, for that uh, wonderfully enlightening and slightly depressing <laughs> presentation. It's a little bit scary. Um, but important for us all to think about and, and discuss and realize what's happening and how we need to adjust and acclimatize. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Can you talk briefly about how these wines were made? Yep. Um, those two wines, um, at first, I'm a wine grower. So these wines are from very old vineyards, 40 years old. And what, is, what we have seen also this morning, tasting the berries is very, very important to me. I do it not in that uh, kind of science. I do it just with my stomach feeling, with my brain, with my kind of organization. And when I'm going to harvest, at, hopefully at the right point. But it, it's a lot of sentences, but it means really a lot. When you're coming closer, you have to, it's like a good uh, soccer player. You can only shoot a goal if you have a ball. Without the ball, nothing is going to happen. So you have to be close. And a good soccer player has his uh, feet on the ball. So this is the reason why I'm running through the rows like crazy, tasting the berries and say, OK, let's, what about the weather forecast? When can we pick? And some uh, vineyards we are only picking in the afternoon in the sun. But really, every drop of water is, is, uh, is dried out. We. The wines are, all the Riesling berries are de-stemmed. The, when they are chilled down to seven degrees Celsius, uh, it's a nice parallel to a Friuli. I like to do a cold maceration or a, a time on the skins to extract the flavor. It would be really a shame to to bring the flavor again in the vineyard. I think this is nonsense. We, we, we really care about ripe fruit, and then we press immediately, and there's no extraction of the flavor, what we have been working for a whole year. This is really very important. But you have to have healthy ripe grapes and no botrytis. Because botrytis can, if botrytis is extracted, then it can be very negatively. That means bitter notes, phenols, the wine is not clean. But please care about the skin. Taste the skin of the berries. So this is really very, very important. Because the flavor, the nose of a glass of wine, this is the first mes message to you, standing in the cellar, tasting the wine, and also for the customer. The customer is coming, and then he's getting his glass. At first, he's smelling care about the flavor, because this is the, the first sh handshaking with sympathetic or not sympathetic. Then the wine is pressed gently, and I, do, I like to do a settlement for 48 to 60 hours, because I wa only want to ferment clear juice. In the 90s, we did. Um, a fermentation with wild yeast, it worked pretty well. I do not know, maybe because of global warming, we are getting now in August 
a lot of rainfall, we are getting more botrytis. And since 2000, we never did, uh, or we in really limited cases, we did uh, fermentation with wild yeast. What we are using actually is uh, Saraomyces baianus yeast, which is mainly used for sh champagne because this yeast is very neutral. There's no sense to build up flavor in the vineyard, and later on, you're putting to that a very intense yeast with a lot of flavor, which covers totally what you have done so far. There's no sense. So a neutral yeast, and I watch very careful, carefully fermentation, because white wine should be fresh all the time. It's, if white wine is getting bright, and when you have a lack of elegance, and in, in charge for that is a steady, is the steady process of fermentation. It can be slowly, but it must be steady, not interrupted. This is what I have to point out. Fermentation takes time between three weeks and six weeks. Each wine is uh, racked after we analyze of residual sugar. In our country, actually, uh, it's almost impossible to, to sell sweet wines. We have a, the main market are dry Rieslings. And so the border of nine gram per liter residual sugar is really a border because customers are asking for dry wines. And the European definition of, dry, of a dry wine is below nine grams per liter sugar. 0.9 gram, 0.9 percent. And after this analyze, if, if we are below, when we, when we are tasting the wine, and of course it's a matter of experience, then we decide is it right or is it wrong to rack it because uh, we have a phrase in our language, the mother of a wine is the yeast. So we have to decide after tasting a cloudy, fermenting liquid, we have, we have to see finally the glass wine in New York, Jean Change, for example. This is how I feel, how I'm a winemaker, how I do the wines. After wrecking, wines are staying, they are not filtered then, we have some yeast in there, and this yeast is also important. In some cases, we, we are doing batonnage also with Riesling, and those two wines were made in um, 1,200 liter oak casks, not in stainless steel. I like stainless steel for slate, for lighter soil, but the heavy ones, the rich soils, they have to be put into uh, oak. But you have to know the oak from the inside, not only from the outside, I tell you. Because uh, while the barrels are clean from the inside and I take really a great care about that. This is really very important. If you buy a large oak, then you have to know that you really you have to clean three times as, a, as much as a stainless steel tank. Is that enough? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.